we'll look at and uh, on Sunday evenings looking at restoration slogans. And I think most of these will be familiar to most members of the church for a long time. They're not heard very much now. They're not very common in our language or our discussions. But these are slogans that are very familiar to most of the Christians in the past, at least in this country for a long time. They've been repeated numerous times in lessons and gospel meetings and a lot of writings that our brethren have done over time. And we want to remember as we talk about these slogans that a slogan is not scripture. But a slogan or a saying can express a scriptural idea, just like the songs that we just uh, engaged in tonight and in this afternoon before our service, written by men, but they most of all of them express different biblical teachings in man's words. And so a slogan is, is similar to that. It's written by a man and it's used to remind us of some teaching or some principle, some point that we want to continue to um, address and let people know about. And so the slogan often will help us. It's usually designed to be catchy, to help us to remember something, to remember a principle or a, a Bible teaching. And, and if you look at the word slogan, originally it meant a war cry, and it also came to be understood as a word or phrase used to express a characteristic position or a stand or a goal to be achieved. And so tonight we're going to look at the phrase or the slogan, where the Bible speaks, we speak, where the Bible is silent, we are silent. We're going to notice that there is a biblical basis to this statement. And these, these slogans were once really, again, commonly used. We knew them. We, we let people know about them because whenever people would ask, well, who are the churches of Christ? What do you believe? This was one of the main ones that was often uh, responded with. Well, we strive to speak where the Bible speaks. We strive to be silent where the Bible is silent. In other words, the Bible is our, it, it guides everything we do, everything we believe, and whatever we practice, we have to be able to find it in the Word of God. These are really small pictures, uh, but these are representative. These two pictures um, were given out, I don't know how many years ago now, there's no years on them, but by A.M. Burton at the National Life and Accident Insurance Company in Nashville. And they would send these out to uh, a lot of their customers and subscribers to the Gospel Advocate and things. And so on the left side, you have a lot of the restoration well-known names like Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell and Walter Scott. And then the one on the right has David Lipscomb, and T.W. Brents, who, T.W. Brents, for example, is buried in Lewisburg, and he was one of the most well-known restoration writers and preachers. Uh, T.B. Larimore, H. Leo Bowles, a lot of those. And those are historical names. Those are names that are in our, in our church history. And, you know, one of the speakers this summer, and I, this could have been in a summer series, uh, but it might have been at PTP, I'm not sure, but made, made the point, I think it was even Brother David saying, to be honest, in his lesson, about history and how sadly today we don't really know even our recent history, just going back a couple hundred years, of the, of the people who did practice where the Bible speaks, we speak, where the Bible is silent, we are silent. They were leaders in that way. They didn't start the church. They didn't build the church. Alexander Campbell did not found the Church of Christ. He was not the one who established it. We go all the way back in our Bibles, don't we, to Acts 2. There is the establishment of the Church of Christ. As Peter preached the gospel and as the people responded to the message to repent and be baptized, and verse 47 says the Lord added them to the church, didn't he? That's when the church of Christ was established, the New Testament church. But we've had a lot of brethren since, haven't we? As we read our Bibles and study and we look at history and you see the, the expanse of the church through the work of the Apostle Paul and everybody since then who's been a New Testament Christian and has done good works, whether they've preached the gospel to crowds or one-on-one, -on -one, whether they've done some service or sowed a seed, 
to help a result come about where God would give the increase. That's who we are. That's what we're about. And so as we talk about some of these men and as we talk about some of the people that are very familiar in our history, you know, we're not trying to make them bigger than they are, but they were good people. They were striving to do what this phrase and slogan says, to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. As we go back and we find, especially on the left side, all the like Campbells and Walter Scott and a lot of them, they were literally stepping out of denominationalism. They were leaving that. And they were searching for the right way. They didn't always do the right thing or believe the right thing, but they were working themselves out of a denominational mindset. They were willing to put away the creeds of man, the books and the manuals and the catechisms, set those aside. Many of them were fired from their works. They were run out of towns because they said, well, we're going to go by just this book, the Bible. We're going to reject everything else, and we're going to take the Word of God. And so that's who we're talking about, and that's the goal that we want to have, isn't it? Well, let's think about the source of the words of where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we are silent. Again, this is probably one of the most famous slogans that, that has been uttered in the Restoration Movement. And it was spoken by Thomas Campbell during a gathering in 1809. And there was a group of people gathered together, and they were just gathering together to study and to hear some lessons regarding this very thing of going back to the Bible. And so the church, we know, was already in existence in America. And so as Thomas Campbell came in 1807, Alexander Campbell came in 1809, there are a lot of documents and gravestones and historical records that show members of the church way before they came to America. The church was here. How do we know that the church can be established and, and in any generation at any given time? It's when the seed is sown, isn't it? The seed, Luke 8, 11, is the Word of God. And so people all along had been sowing the seed. The seed is always going to be here, God said. So we'll always have his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not my words. And so as that seed is sown, the church has existed all along the way, at least in seed form. But the church was in existence. And so in this gathering, a large crowd had assembled to hear, how can we overcome religious division? How can we put this to rest? How can we come and be united together as one people? And so in the midst of that discussion and the talks and the lessons, Thomas Campbell declared this slogan where he said, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. And that is the essence of the restoration plea. Notice here, and uh, there was a discussion that went forth when Campbell made this point. Andrew Munro, who was a Scottish bookseller, said, Mr. Campbell, if we adopt that as a basis, then there is an end of infant baptism. Thomas Campbell replied, he said, of course, if infant baptism is not to be found in the scriptures, we can have nothing to do with it. So you think about these people, many of them were coming out of Presbyterianism. They had believed in the you know, infant baptism and the sprinkling of infants. And notice how that principle was put right to work. We know as we study our Bibles, there is nowhere in there that authorizes the baptism of infants or to sprinkle an infant. There's no authority for it. But rather, who's baptism for? It's for believers, isn't it? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. And so it was starting to get their minds to work. As these people, this is all they had known was denominational teaching. And so to hear this, they said, well, if we do take the Bible, then we can't practice infant baptism because infant baptism is over here in our creed book. This is our discipline over here. That's where infant baptism is. But if we reject that and we take the Bible, there's an end to infant baptism. Campbell said that's exactly right. Well, another man, Thomas Akinson, he said, I hope I may never see the day when my heart will renounce that blessing, 
saying of the Scriptures, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. It's recorded in history that then he burst into tears. Well, another man addressed him, and he said, Mr. Akinson, I would remark that in the portion of Scripture you have quoted, there is no reference whatever to infant baptism. And so people were starting to think. This was opening up their minds. And, you know, it's, it's hard maybe for us to understand, some of us that have grown up in the church, and we, we understand these principles from an early age. But think about those among us even that have come out. You understand that coming out of denominationalism. You've been in that cloud. And you've been in that false teaching for so long that it just seems natural. But then when you come to take the Bible only as your only rule of faith and practice, then people, we, we realize, well, I can't practice this anymore. There's no authority for infant baptism. Only baptism for those who can understand that they're lost in sin, and by faith they can respond and be immersed. That's all baptism's for. It can't be for an infant. And so this is what these people were working through. And so the idea of the source of this statement, and so think about that being in 1809, in our Bibles, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, notice the principle here. As the Bible says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Does that not sound exactly like what we're talking about? Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we're silent. Let us only speak as the oracles of God. If anyone's going to speak, only speak that which the Bible teaches or that the Bible authorizes. And so we go back and we notice this was happening then, and we understand they were working out of this religious confusion. They were working out of a denominational mindset, trying to work to come to the truth. And so where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, is silent we are silent, became the rallying cry of so many of those good people. And so it was upheld as a principle upon which unity could be established and maintained and where there could be sound doctrine and there could be security in knowing we're doing what the Bible says by going back to the Bible. And so the idea of the source of the words. Well, let's then focus on the scripturalness of these words. We just mentioned 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. But there are other verses, many more than what we're going to list tonight. But notice Jesus in John 12 and verse 50. Jesus said there, he said, And I know that, that his commandment is eternal life. When I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So just as the Apostle Peter makes it clear, and he's speaking by inspiration of God, and he says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And then we have the words of Jesus when he says, What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus was practicing that, wasn't he? All through his ministry, all through his recorded work and life, over and over he would say this in different ways phrases, but it was the same teaching. I'm only going to say or do what I've received from my Father in heaven. And the, the phrase in 1 Peter 4.11 is essentially saying the same thing. As a Christian, I am only going to speak as the oracles of God. I'm only going to use the framework of the Bible as my guide and my authority. And it's going to guide me in everything. The Bible alone. And so the scripturalness of these words. We also think about 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and if you'll notice the first four verses there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and Paul is speaking, and he said, And when I came to you, he's talking to the church at Corinth, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom 
or a wisdom of man, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. It's really what we're talking about, isn't it? Am I going to speak in the words of man, or am I going to speak in the words of God? And we know there's no middle ground there. And as 1 Peter 4, 11 reminds us, as John 12, 50, as we follow the example of Jesus, we can only afford to speak in the scriptural way, by the authority of the Bible, by the teaching of the Word of God. 2 John, beginning in verse 9 through 11, notice the Bible there reminds us, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. And so we're reminded we have to stay in the teaching of Christ, don't we? The doctrine of Christ. And, and John warns us here, he said, if, if we go on, if we go beyond, or we fall short and we don't abide where we're supposed to abide in the oracles of God, then we leave the fellowship of God and of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Well, now look where that puts us. Then we're outside, aren't we? We're outside of the way of grace. We're outside of the way of salvation. And we're going to be displeasing to God. Jesus was really clear in Matthew 15, beginning in verse 9, when he said, You know, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Don't you suppose that verse would have been on the minds and hearts of a lot of those early Restoration people? As they would read that and they would say, Look at Jesus. He says if we worship him according to the doctrines, our manuals and our disciplines and our rule books, Jesus says... We're worshiping in vain. It's empty. It has no meaning. It has nothing that God will accept. And so in verses 13 and 14 of the same chapter, Jesus said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And so we must live by faith. How does faith come? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Well, that goes hand in hand, doesn't it? In speaking as the oracles of God. And so where the Bible speaks, we speak. And so the scripturalness of these words. Let's further think about the significance of these words. And what we're to preach and how we're to live and how we're to conduct all the things that are within our um, Christian life and in the life of the church. And so the Bible tells us what to preach. Jesus said, preach the gospel, didn't he? In Mark 16 and verse 15. Elsewhere, Paul said, we're to preach the word. We're to, we're to preach the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 4.2. The Bible does not authorize us preaching idle speculations or philosophy or politics or man's wisdom or man's ideas. We have no authority to preach those things because God said, preach the Word, the oracles of God. The Word that Jesus received from the Father, that's the Word we're to preach. And so the Bible tells us, doesn't it, what we can preach and practice. It tells us all about the worship of the church, the work of the church, the organization of the church. The Bible doesn't talk about different kinds of of worship that we're to engage in or different works or different organizations, but there's just one way to worship in spirit and in truth. There's just one way to work, and, and that's by the authority of Jesus Christ. Practice everything, do everything by His authority. And then the way the church is organized. We have no authority to organize beyond what God has established. God has set forth just how the church is to be, the one body of Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. He set forth shepherds over the congregations, individual congregations, the autonomy of the church. We're independent, each congregation. We find that we're to, we're to have those that serve, the deacons, we're to have ministers, we have all members. And that's the terminology and, and the 
organization of the church. Anything beyond that, we've gone beyond. If we fall short, obviously we're still not pleasing to God if we strive to go about in an unauthorized way. What about our being forgiven? We're forgiven based upon certain conditions, aren't we? Certain things have to be in place. God knows my heart. He knows that, all right, you're willing to repent and turn from your sin. He knows when I pray to Him and call upon His name to seek forgiveness for the sin I've committed. He understands and He listens then when I've confessed that. That's the only way to be right with God. God has His way, and it's the only way comes through the teaching of the Word of God, isn't it? And so it reminds us, that's exactly it. To speak as the oracles of God, I've got to understand everything through that biblical lens. I'm going to do everything by the Word of God. I'm going to speak where it speaks, and wherever it's silent, God is not giving me the directive, okay now, Steve, you can go on and do things the way you want to do them. No, He's not. He's saying if I'm silent, then respect that silence, isn't He? That's what He's telling us. Don't go building beyond. Don't go teaching beyond. Don't go adding and taking away from the Word of God. And there on the board, on the slide, you know, Deuteronomy 4.2. So we go to the Old Testament and we're reminded, God said, you shall not add to the Word that I command you nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Someone will say, well, that's under the Old Testament. You all say that you're not under the Old Testament now. True. But God still has the principles all along in His Word. And then Revelation 22, 18 and 19, I warn you that everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. God's pretty clear, isn't he? Don't add, don't, don't take away, but speak where the Bible speaks. Speak as the oracles of God and be silent where the Bible is silent. All of these points in our, the middle of our lesson tonight are really tied together the, as we think about the scripturalness of these words, the significance, and then having them built biblically illustrated. Notice 1 Corinthians 4, 6. We can't get any plainer than this. When Paul told the Corinthians, he said, don't go beyond what is written. Yet as we look into the history of man, Wow, man, we, we violated, our human beings have, we've violated this in every generation, in every place throughout the globe, haven't we? Where we think we are wiser than God, we think that our way is a great way, and so then man compiles these documents and books and materials, and then they end up having people that gather together and follow just that writing, those writings of mankind. That's how people get away from the Bible, isn't it? That's how they get into that mindset of, of man's teaching. And Jesus said, look, if you follow man's teaching, you're worshiping me in vain. And it's empty. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Again, that's reminding us, stay within the confines of the Word of God. And we mentioned a few moments ago, Romans 10 and verse 17. And so we're to stay within the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 9. What about the second part of this slogan? We've looked at the first, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Speak, Peter said, as the oracles of God. As God's Word teaches, speak that. Under the time in which we're living, and obviously we know what is bound today is the New Testament bound upon us. But what about the silence of the Bible? You know, the second part of this has often been misunderstood and misrepresented because people get some, some different ideas about what does it mean regarding being silent where the Bible is silent. Some have even argued that the Bible is silent, for example, about instrumental music and worship. And they say, well, then we shouldn't speak about it or teach about it or say anything even against it if the Bible doesn't say anything about it. 
And so long ago, one of the great preachers of the past, G.C. Brewer, he stated this in answer to that. He said, everyone should know that the meaning of this well-known motto is that we practice that which the Bible authorizes and we decline to practice that which the Bible does not authorize. Surely everybody should know that that is what the words speak and silent mean. To remain silent means that we will stop practicing where the Bible stops teaching and that our practice in matters of religion is limited by the word of the Lord, restricted by divine revelation. That means, that is what the motto means, as everyone should know, and therefore the man who introduces something in the worship that the Bible does not authorize is the one who is speaking where the Bible is silent. He is practicing that for which he has no scriptural authority. And so Brother Brewer put that over on those. If, if someone comes in and says, well, we want to have instrumental music, and we say, well, we're going to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. The Bible doesn't authorize that. What are we meaning further to build upon the point that Brother Brewer made there? The point is, there are a couple of different forms of silence. And so has God spoken about what kind of music we should have in our worship? He has. He's been very specific, hasn't he? And so in Ephesians 5.19, in Colossians 3.16, and several other passages in the New Testament, the Bible, the, all the evidence we have, and it's united, is we're to sing one to another. Each of us is to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. God said, I'm, He's very specific. So you sing and we make melody in our heart to the Lord. That's the only authorization that we have. The melodies to be made in our heart, not on a mechanical instrument. And so that's where we're speaking where the Bible speaks, we're being silent where the Bible is silent. And so our faith must respect the silence of the Scriptures. Way back, we remember Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10 and verse 1, and the Bible records that they had offered, as one translation says, strange or profane fire. Another translation translated that they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord and they were put to death because they did that which was unauthorized. They didn't speak where the Bible speaks. They weren't silent where the Bible was silent. And so permissive silence. The idea, and there's been groups of people who think that Anything that is not expressly forbidden is permissible. So these people that would try to bring instrumental music in would say, well, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not. But the Bible does say what kind of music to have in our worship, doesn't it? Sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But we understand this to be prohibitive silence. The idea that Biblical silence was prohibitive. That means that anything not expressly authorized is forbidden. That's why we don't have a solo. That's why we don't have a choir. That's why we don't have women preachers. That's why we don't have a band up here. That's why we don't do a host of things is because the Bible does not authorize those things. The Bible is silent on them in the sense the Bible has authorized other ways of performing our duty, acting in such a way as to be pleasing to God. So where the Bible is silent, we are silent. You know, we often enter, uh, talk about going and preaching the gospel to the whole world. We're told what to do. Jesus said, go, preach the gospel. We know what the gospel is. We know what the Word of God is. But what about the word go? Has God given us authority to go in any way that we can? He certainly has. You think about back in some of those men we mentioned, those were in horse and buggy days or just riding a horse cross country over the mountains to, to do their work, to preach, to travel. You think about that. Well, that's not the only mode of transportation, is it? And so think about all the ways in which we could communicate and travel today. God says, go. And so He's authorizing us in any generation that we live to go in however manner we can, 
to get the gospel out there. And so riding the horse was authorized. Today driving our car or getting in an airplane or using a text message, that's authorized because God said, go, get the message out there. That's the wisdom of God, isn't it? But we know that God has been very prohibitive in his silence regarding, as we talked about tonight, instrumental music and a whole bunch of other topics we could put under that. As we think about the slogan of instrumental music, of, and as we think about the slogan of speaking where the Bible speaks and being silent where the Bible is silent, and we think about these issues that we've just talked about. We have a lot to do. We have a lot to study about, don't we? Continually, each generation, as we continue to fulfill 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, where Paul talked about we're to teach and train others so that they'll go and teach and train others, and then they'll do the same thing to other people, and it goes from generation to generation. While we look at this slogan tonight that's really old, it's from previous generations, but it still has meaning tonight, doesn't it? Because we still have 1 Peter 4 and verse 11 in our Bibles. Speak as the oracles of God. Speak where the Bible speaks. Be silent where the Bible is silent. Hopefully we'll continue to hear those words and speak more about them to one another and to those outside. It's a great opportunity, isn't it, for us to tell others about just who we are and use a slogan that's built upon a biblical principle. Tonight, if you're with us and you're not a New Testament Christian, as we've talked about, the only way to find out how to be a Christian is in the Bible, God's Word. Man's Word is not going to measure up. We're never going to be saved by the words of man. But only the precious words of Jesus. When Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, Jesus wants us to come to him for salvation, for, for cleansing, to have my sins washed away through his blood that he shed on Calvary. Can we assist you tonight by assisting you to be baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins so that you can go on in joy in your heart and in your life, being a child of God, living the Christian life and knowing that as you live faithful, when you leave this earth, you'll be in the presence of God for eternity. Maybe you're with us tonight, and this is all very familiar, but maybe it's been some time that you've been faithful, that you've walked with God, that you've walked faithfully with Jesus and been a part of the church. As we've talked about recently, and as the Bible reminds us as a Christian, what do I do when I sin and fall short? I repent of my sins, I pray to God, I confess them to my Father, and the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us. He'll forgive us completely and restore us to his fellowship to be cleansed once again and to continually be cleansed as I walk in the light. Can we help you tonight as we stand and sing?